the, the live stream that will be um, uh, put on uh, Facebook and YouTube, etc. this evening, I, I do want to make mention again uh, about what did happen down in Texas. And so yesterday was my grandson Zeke's third birthday. And Jennifer and I picked him up right around 6 o'clock, and we took him to the mall, and we got him a Chick-fil-A ice cream cone. Well, actually, we didn't get it in a cone. We got it in a cup. We felt like that might be a little less messy, and that, that proved to be the case. And then we took him to, you know, how a lot of malls will have these little rides. And um, we, we fully intended to be big spenders and just spend, you know, two, three, four, five dollars in quarters and put those in there and, and see the thing. Well, he, he's just a little cautious. He did not get that from me, but uh, he's a little cautious on things. And so, I mean, he, he would like to get in there and kind of mess around with them, but he has to warm up even to do that. But if we'd have put some quarters in there and all of a sudden that thing, man, he'd have just gone bonkers. And so uh, after we finished up with that, um, I had left my phone in, in, the, in Jennifer's vehicle and Jennifer had left her phone at home. So we're in the mall for approximately 45 minutes or so, and we come back out, and that's when I noticed that I had received a text. Jennifer and I both had. Uh, Kim Everts had sent us a text and said, have you guys heard about what has happened down in Texas? And we had not um, because that news was just breaking while we were. And so my thought was, here we are celebrating our grandson's third birthday while dozens of people are overwhelmed with grief and sorrow over the loss of their grandsons, granddaughters, their sons, and their daughters. And so as Kevin led us in prayer a few moments ago, um, the scriptures teach us to weep with those who weep. And I'm thankful that he prayed in his prayer about asking the Lord to draw some of those people to a saving knowledge of himself. Uh, because I'm hoping that the gospel will be shared uh, both with individuals and also uh, during those funerals. And so uh, there, there are so many things that you could say, you could comment on about it. But boy, just to, to, to be moved with compassion toward those who are going through what they're going through. And some of that's going to come out in what I would like to share with you this morning. So my, my title of my message this morning is Pursuits That Aren't Trivial. Now, that's a little bit of a takeoff on the game that maybe some of us have played. A lot of us have played at some point. It's not as popular as it used to be, but Trivial Pursuit. It's a game where you're an answering questions and you're asking answering questions and you're trying to compete, et cetera, et cetera. So pursuits that are not trivial. So my opening illustration takes us back to 1968. It is during the Olympic Games that are taking place in Mexico City's Olympic Stadium. And I want to show you the picture of the guy who finished last. The guy who finished last, his name is John Stephen Akwari. And John Stephen Akwari, he finished like an hour or two after the person who won the race won the race. And you're probably wondering, well, why would I even be commenting on John Stephen Akwari for finishing last? Well, here's the, the back story. Um, after an Ethiopian man by the name of Memo Walde had won the race, everybody's assuming that all the other runners have made it in. Everybody who's going to finish the race has finished the race. And then, well, an hour after the race is over, all of a sudden you hear these whistles blowing and these sirens indicating that another participant, another runner has entered the stadium. And next thing you know, just a handful of a few thousand people who are remaining in the stadium, they begin to stand up and, and cheer and just, it's almost as if he had run the race. And so the reason that he was so much further behind and was the last one to finish the race was because he fell during the race, severely injured his leg, had to stop, had to have it treated, had to have it bandaged. And so you see a picture there. That is him as he is a few meters away from completing a 26.2 mile marathon. If that picture's a little grainy, but... I don't think they had any good images because no photographers were expecting this. And so here he is grimacing with every single step. Afterwards, someone comes up to him and says, why in the world with you with an injured, bloody leg, knowing the race had been won 
an hour t- plus ago, why in the world would you do what you have done? And he said in so many words, my country did not send me 7,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 7,000 miles to finish the race. And so he represented his country well and finished the race. Many of you know that there are several different allusions in Scripture to us as Christians running a race. Not a sprint, but a race. And as a matter of fact, here in Hebrews chapter 12, the first couple of verses talk about seeing that we're encompassed with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run with patience or endurance the race that is set before us. This is a marathon. This race of the Christian life lasts from the moment of your conversion until the day of your death or until the day of the rapture, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I feel confident that all of us, at least in our right minds, have a longing to finish well. This past Monday in the office, I don't know how many of you are aware, um, and I don't want to bog down here, but the Southern Baptist Convention is in a horrible situation trying to deal with a lot of sexual assault cases that have been covered up at some of its educational institutions, some of its churches. It is not pretty whatsoever. I would not want to be a part of their national convention that's coming up here soon. And so during staff meeting on Monday, we're we're talking about that. And we're just kind of sharpening each other's iron And during that staff meeting, before we even got into our actual staff meeting, each of us were saying some things that were applicable for us all. And I encouraged the other four guys and was talking up to myself, guys, let's make sure we do everything possible to make sure our marriages are what they are to be. Guys, I I urge them as I'm urging myself to be good, godly husbands, selfless husbands. You do anything and everything you can to make sure you meet the needs of your wife, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then as our conversation continued, I told the guys, and I've said something similar to this on more than one occasion from the pulpit, but I have what I call a holy jealousy of someone like Bobby Jackson, Someone like my father-in-law, men like that, men like Billy Graham who passed away, what, give or take two or three years ago, I'm losing track. You know, he died without any um, marks against his integrity. Brother Bobby, Dennis Wiggs, and others like them, I don't know how many more years they have, but they are in the process of finishing well. Miss Linda, Mr. James fit that category. He finished well. And so it does not really matter how you start. It's not necessarily all that vitally important how well you run the race during the race. That's important. But boy, you need to finish well. Paul himself said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Notice, Paul does not say as he's seeing death coming around the corner as he knows it's, it's just a matter of moments or days before his head's going to be severed from his body. He doesn't say, I, I won the race. He said, no, I fought, I finished, and I kept on keeping on in this particular race. So Paul there, the writer of Hebrews here in chapter 12, is talking about endurance. I'll be talking some, Lord willing, this coming Sunday about endurance when we talk about the fruit of the spirit of patience. Boy, it, just my studies thus far on Monday have, 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 I don't know whether it's enlightened me or reminded me there are some components about patience that goes far beyond just, just sitting at a stoplight and not, not using inappropriate language. Um, patience has an element of endurance. Patience also involves waiting on God. And in the meantime, enduring whatever it is that we have to endure during life down here. And so, therefore, this concept of the Christian life being likened to a marathon, not a sprint, not a 100-yard dash, not a 100-meter dash, but a marathon. Now, 
In addition to everything else I've said, if you were to look at the context of Hebrews chapter 12, once you leave those very familiar verses in the first two, you start seeing in verses three and following references to God's discipline of his people. God's chastening of his people. And folks, sometimes the Lord disciplines his children. He deals with them not because of sin. Sometimes he will apply discipline to their lives because it will be good for them. All right, so I mentioned Zeke being three yesterday and Iva, she's um, two-ish. And so sometimes when kids that are very, very young, let's, let's just imagine um, that they've got one of their little spoons. It's one of those little short ones. It, it's, it's actually the kind that I want to reveal something. My Jennifer, she eats her ice cream with the baby spoon. <laughs> she does. You can pick on her afterwards. But she does. She's got a little spoon about that long. And I, I don't know for certain if this is the one she used to feed, Jenna, Jake, and Joanna, but she, she likes that baby spoon because it makes the ice cream last longer. But okay, so imagine... Zeke or Iva has that little baby spoon and they go over and stick it into an electrical socket or attempt to. Do you think we're going to just sit back and say, oh, won't this be cute? No. We're going to say, no, don't do that. And if in the process of them maybe still trying to do it, we smack their hand, we will not have smacked his or her hand because they did something morally wrong. We did something that would keep them from doing something else that would have caused harm. And sometimes the Lord will bring discipline in our lives. And I'm not using that in the sense of disciplining us because we've done something wrong, but sometimes he will discipline us to keep us from doing something that would harm us. Sometimes the discipline just involves resistance, and the resistance helps us be strengthened with our spiritual muscles. It helps us mature in our Christian faith. Um, so when, when you're subjected to all of the issues of life in general, when you're fighting against sin, fighting against temptation, and at times even having to fight against the, well, not fight, but, but deal with the discipline of the Lord, you can get weary. You can be worn and that's the, the imagery that we're going to be looking at when we come down a little bit further in chapter 12 of uh, Hebrews. We're going to be looking at verses 12, 13, and 14, but especially parts of verses 12 and 14. So, because of the fierceness of the battle, because of the fatigue that is caused by the battle that we're in, this passage will remind us of the need for faithfulness during the battle. And you and I, are going to be called upon in this passage to help one another in this race, in this battle. And so my, my purpose in uh, sharing this message with you is to give you two pursuits that all of us should have as we minister one to another in the race of the Christian life. Number one, pursue the wounded and weary. Pursue the wounded and weary. And we're going to see in verse 12, my exhortation to all of us this morning, this evening, for those of you who are watching on the live stream, is to be an encouragement to them. So we're going to pursue the wounded and the weary, and we want to be an encouragement to them. Notice with me Hebrews 12, verse 12. Therefore, all right, so in light of the discipline the Lord sometimes gives, in light of the fact that we're running this race and it's a long endurance race, therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. That's an interesting passage. The writer of Hebrews is actually quoting from Isaiah chapter 35, verse 3, which says, strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. And so again, the whole imagery is of someone in a long distance race whose hands have become feeble. Now, I don't know a whole lot about my hands getting feeble because of a long distance run, because I don't like them. Don't worry, you won't ever catch me out running in a marathon. I don't ever see that happening. I don't like long distance running. So I can relate to this more in the game of basketball. 
So when you're playing basketball, if, if you're playing good defense, you know where your hands up, you, you know where your hands are? They're up. Your, your hands are going to always be up. They're going to be moving. And so in the game of basketball, if you show me somebody who is winded, you know what they're doing? They got their hands on their shorts. Man, they're, they're, and when you're really worn and tired, it's hard, it's hard to keep your hands up. And so sometimes you and I will interact with people who spiritually are going through this race, this Christian race, with all the hardships and all the difficulties, and their spiritual hands will get weary. And here we're being told to strengthen those feeble hands. Now, when it comes to feeble knees, well, I, I, could, I could talk about Rex, but I, I talk about Rex so often that I'll, I'll give him a pass on this one. Uh, but he does have some, some issues with his knees, probably some arthritis that gets in there. When he and I have done some of our hikes at the Grand Canyon and places, his knees can really, really cause a lot of pain. Um, but I'm thinking especially of my son Jake's senior year at GCA. I'm thinking about the fact that Jake would experience a torn ACL of both of his knees on separate occasions. And this first one was fifth game of the season at GCA, and uh, Jake, I know I'm biased in a number of ways, but he probably was our overall best player. He might not could have been the one to jump the highest or run the fastest, but you put it all together, and he was probably our best player. Fifth game of the season. We're on our bench, the home team. I'm helping coach, and Jake steals the ball, and he's going down to the opposite end. And a, a, a kid from the other team kind of cuts across right at the basket. And so Jake does a little bit of a step over to kind of avoid uh, contact with him and then lays it up. He gets fouled, comes down, and he doesn't get up. And he's writhing in pain. And, of course, I've already told you what happened. We didn't know it at the time. Um, but Jake's knee is just hurting him so badly. And so at the moment, not knowing what he's done, you know what I did? I mean, I'm already down there. The, the head coach is down there, and we're standing around, and some of the guys who were you know, playing at the time were standing around, and, and we realized something's, something's wrong. I picked my boy up, and I towed him the whole length of the court back down to the bench. Well, folks, sometimes... Your brothers and sisters are going to tear something. And I'm not talking about an ACL or an Achilles tendon, even though we can apply it to that too. But sometimes we go through this life and we get injured. We go through this life and we get hurt. And God has so designed the body of Christ that there are going to be some times when we've got people that we know whose hands are feeble and they can't, they can't raise them up by themselves, whose knees are feeble as it were, and they just can't get from one place to the other like they used to, literally and figuratively. And Scripture tells us to come alongside and strengthen those hands and to strengthen those knees. Notice it does not say, even though this is probably can be taught for other passages. It didn't say strengthen your hands, strengthen your knees. It's saying strengthen everybody else's, strengthen other people's hands, other people's knees. Boy, Paul and Barnabas, as they blazed a trail for the gospel, they learned the fierceness and the fatigue that comes from the struggle. And not only did they themselves joyfully and undauntedly persevere, they also strengthened the souls, the hands, and the knees, as it were, of others. Get a hold, make sure we get a good running start here. I'm going to be reading from Acts chapter 14, verse 22. In Acts 14, Paul is stoned at Lystra. Now, if you were stoned somewhere, do you think you'd want to go back there? I don't think so. After being stoned in Lystra, Paul and Barnabas depart. They preach the gospel at a few other places, and then Scripture says they went back to Lystra and went back to some of the other places. Verse 22, strengthening 
the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Can you imagine the voice, the megaphone? I'm not talking about a literal megaphone, but can you imagine the way that Paul with bruises, indentions in his body that aren't going to ever go? Can you imagine him standing there before those people who saw him get stoned, who saw him on the verge of dying, and he comes right back, knowing it could happen again, and he's telling those people, look, folks, you got to go through who knows what. And I'm here to encourage you. So he strengthened their feeble hands and their feeble knees when he did that. In an actual race, runners have to deal with both mental and physical hindrances. Sometimes you can get discouraged mentally. From what I'm told, <laughs> you know, those who do marathons, I mean, man, you, you can have some psychological blocks and you can just feel like you can't go anymore. I bet I could get a witness in here about discouragement. Just plain old discouragement. Probably everybody in this room has had times when you needed somebody to help hold up your feeble hands and kind of support you with your feeble knees. And some of you have done that for me. Spiritually, we can get discouraged. And we need to maintain our hope and maintain our joy. After all, Paul tells us to keep on seeking those things which are above, to keep on seeking the kingdom of God, keep our minds on those kinds of things. So let me just ask a question and then attempt to provide some answers. How can you and I obey what's expected of us in this text? When you and I, if, if, you're, if you're just doing your own devotions and you're reading this, and you're reading the scripture and it says to strengthen those hands which hang down, strengthen the feeble knees, what does that mean? How do you put that into practice? How do you apply that? Can I give you some suggestions? This is just a sampling. One, and I realize that this is so obvious, but yet you can pray. You can pray for them. And now listen to me. You can pray and without any arrogance, let the person know that you're praying for them. Do you know how often I hear my father-in-law doing that? He's making a phone call and he's just letting you know that I'm, I'm praying for you. Do you know how encouraging that is to those who get that phone call? And anybody in here can do that. Now, some may can do it better than others. And some may have giftedness from God's spirit that enables you... But this passage here is not just for pastors. It's not just for certain individuals with certain spiritual gifts. All the body is told to do this. You can write a card or write a letter or send an email or send a text. All of those things can be applicable and can help strengthen feeble hands and feeble knees. You can be there. You can be there. Um, so... I don't want to cross over any lines, but I'm going to leave it just very generic. I, I learned of people in our church who have stayed with people in our church who were going through the valley of the shadow of death because of the death of a spouse. And they stayed there with them for a few nights and even slept in the bed with them. Just to be there to strengthen the feeble hands, to strengthen those feeble knees. Financial support. Sometimes the burden, the burden is financial. Folks, some of you will remember, I, part of this I vividly remember, part of it I don't. I, the part that's not as vivid as I would think it ought to be, I think our church helped Harvey Case buy a lift chair. I know we helped him buy something, and I think it was a lift chair. Here's what I do vividly remember. I'm calling him to tell him about it. You know, Mr. Harvey, the one who used to call most all of you and sing happy birthday, he started crying. He just started crying. Because the, the church helping him get this lift chair was such an encouragement to him. And God may have gifted you 
with sufficient funds to be a real financial blessing to others. Just, sometimes just saying positive things, genuinely complimenting somebody. Um, boy, I'm reminded of what Proverbs 15, 23 says, a word in season, how good it is. And there ain't nobody in this room who's going to tell me the truth and say that you don't benefit from a compliment. We all do. We can all benefit from a compliment, something nice being said about us. You can do that, and boy, it'll kind of lift those feeble hands right up. It'll help somebody get right off that proverbial um, sore knees. Be a positive person, not an energy slug. Some people are that way. They just drink, but n nobody like that in here. Just make sure we don't become one. Share your story and give God the glory. Don't paint yourself as some kind of a super, super Christian. Don't open up your um, uh, whatever and show some spiritual airs. I'm not. No, you share your story and talk about how God got you through it. It'll help them get through whatever they're going through. Maybe for single moms, you can watch their kids. Give them a night out. Just, just a couple of hours can be life-changing for them. Provide some sort of service. Buy some gift cards. Run errands for somebody. Call or visit. Bring people to church. Um, before Miss Miriam got as kind of weakened as she did, man, I'll tell you what, old Penny Wiseman and uh, Stephanie Humbles, those ladies did ever more minister to her and were bringing her to church pretty regularly on Sundays for a good long while. Um, when you see Thomas, not Thomas, when you see John Stevens sitting up here on the second row, you know who probably brought him? Thomas Forrest. Now, he's not the only one, but he's the one that brings old John the most often. John literally feeble knees. And old Thomas, man, he'll go by and pick him up and bring him to church. So pursuits for all of us while running the Christian race. Number one, pursue the wounded and weary. Number two, Pursue peace and harmony. Pursue peace and harmony. I mentioned to you last week that I'm trying to let most of these Wednesdays be a compliment, if you will, a complimentary uh, reference back to what I preached on Sunday. This past Sunday, we dealt with peace. And part of it was dealing with pursuing peaceful relationships with others. We see that. I referenced verse 14 this past Sunday. Pursue peace with all people. Pursue peace with all people. Now, I don't think anybody in here needs to be told for the first time that God is a God of peace. He is the peacemaker, capital P. He's the one who did everything necessary for us to have peace with him. Well, now, so did, did, does, does the Bible not tell us to be imitators of the Lord, imitators of God? This is one of the best ways you can be an imitator of God is to be a peacemaker yourself. So because we are at peace with God, we should strive to be at peace with others. We should strive to be at peace with others. So when the scripture says here to pursue peace with all people, it, it, it means all people, not just the ones that you used to like and you'd like to resume liking again, but but with all people. And of course, there's a context here of persecution. The Hebrew Christians that this letter is addressed to were at times being persecuted. And the writer here is telling us to, in, in, other, in other words, love our enemy and uh, make peace with all people. Luke 6 tells you to love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. So for some ladies... This past Sunday, and I don't know that it applies now, but for some ladies hearing this, it's going to apply to a husband who, who might be verbally less than nice and kind. Try to pursue peace with them. It might apply to uh, believers who have family members or coworkers who ridicule them, scorn their faith, just trying to see if they can get a reaction out of them pursue a peaceful relationship with them. It can reply to teenagers who might know Christ, who have a mom or a dad who don't. And boy, just trying to maintain a peaceful relationship with them can be challenging at times. 
Pursue peace with all men. This word pursue, I mentioned on Sunday, is a strong word. You don't take this casually. You've got to put forth effort. And for some of us in this room, if you do not pursue a peaceful relationship with somebody, it ain't going to happen. And you're going to have to be diligent about it. It's not going to happen automatically. So can I remind you of one of those startling passages in Scripture? It's found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. It is in the context of temple worship. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. If you are offering your gift, that is your monetary gift, at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First... Be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but that, that's pretty startling stuff right there. If in the process of worshiping God corporately with other believers, it dawns on you that something ain't right between you and another brother or sister in Christ, Scripture says you leave your gift there, you go take care of business, and then come back. So therefore, I would submit to you that reconciliation is a prerequisite for personal worship. Reconciliation is a prerequisite for personal worship. The word first, go and first be reconciled and then come back. Harmonious relationships need to be in place before wonderful worship can take place. Um. So, folks, I've said this kind of thing before, and I hope it won't just go in one ear and out the other, as we sometimes say. But there were some people who were in this sanctuary this past Sunday, or in sanctuaries not unlike it. And truth be told, as far as worshiping God is concerned, they'd have been just as well off to stay home. Now, I'm not saying stay home, but as far as their ability to worship the Lord with that animosity in their heart. They'd have been just as well off as far as their worship is concerned to stay home. They should have gotten reconciled and then come and worshiped like the Lord would have. I'm afraid that every people, people, I'm afraid that every Sunday people sing songs, listen to sermons, take communion, give offerings, even pray, teach, and preach. And they're out of sorts with somebody. They know it, that somebody knows it. And they haven't done anything about it. And God's not happy with that. Right relationships with others are prerequisite for a right relationship with God. So let's just think about how we could enhance worship. Boy, we could, we could get a throw down argument going right now. If we started talking about how to enhance worship, we could talk about the instruments that are used. We could talk about the songs that we sing, the preaching that's done. No. One of the best ways for true worship to be enhanced is by better relationships between those who come to worship. If you and I can come in, whether it's for this occasion or on a Sunday morning or whenever, and if you could walk in and you know in your heart of hearts you've done everything that you could possibly do to be at peace with everybody else walking the planet. That doesn't mean you have peace with everybody, but you've done everything that is possible so far as it depends on you. You've done what you could do. And you can come in here and know that you've tried your best to do everything on the horizontal and therefore the vertical is A-OK. -okay. And your worship of the Lord can be genuine. It can be vibrant. It can be abundant. Even if somebody over here is not in a good relationship with you. You tried and they did not respond. So as you and I walk out of here on our knees, as feeble as they might be literally or figuratively, I would like for us in our daily lives to pursue the wounded and weary and pursue peace and harmony with others. Let's pray. Father, some of this is a whole lot easier for me to preach and teach than it is for any of us to flesh out. But Lord, would you open our hearts and help them to, to be more conscious of people with feeble hands, feeble knees spiritually? people who need somebody to come alongside and just kind of hold their hands up, people come alongside and just kind of help hold them up, as it were, spiritually speaking, figuratively speaking. 
Lord, some of us could make a real big difference in somebody's life if we would just do some of the practical things that we referenced earlier. Lord, help me to do more and more and more of those kinds of things. And Father, help us to keep on seeking peaceful relationships with others. So thankful that through Jesus and his shed blood, we have peace with you. We can enjoy peace of God as well and help us to share it with others. And Lord, help us to flesh out this life for as long as you let us travel it. In Jesus' name, amen.